And with that, I will hand things over to Tanya. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for spending some of your evening with us this evening. Um, we are going to be learning about eels in the Hudson River and the streams around us. I'm Tanya Isa. I'm a board member with the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance. And before introducing our speaker, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. The Rensselaer Plateau sits within the ancestral and traditional homeland and territory of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohicans, who stewarded this land before they were forced to move west to Wisconsin by European settlers. Some Mohican people remained in New York and some have returned home from Wisconsin. The RPA cares for this land today with deep respect and gratitude for the Mohenicok, the people of the waters that are never still. We seek to build lasting partnerships with and to amplify the needs and perspectives of local indigenous communities. I'll be practicing how to pronounce that. It's my pleasure to introduce you this evening to Ben Harris. Ben is a biologist and educator with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Hudson River Estuary Program. He is currently pursuing an advanced degree at Bard's Col Bard College's Center for Environmental Policy, studying environmental education. During the pandemic, Ben started working with the nonprofit Hudsonia studying eels. He got hooked. I completely understand why. After I participated in the DEC eel collection at the mouth of the Post and Kill River in Troy several springs ago. And I think you also will understand why after hearing from Ben tonight about these wondrous far traveling little creatures. Please participate via chat if you have questions. And with that, I'm happy to turn over to Ben. Thank you, Tanya. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you all for coming to listen about the American eel in the Hudson River estuary and how community members along the Hudson River have uh, engaged in eel science um, and how these eels have impacted their lives. Um, as Tanya mentioned, uh, my name is Ben and I'm an educator with the DEC um, and I am quite obsessed with eels and I hope I carry that obsession on to some of you. Um, so please do not hesitate to ask questions or um, have Tanya interrupt me throughout the presentation. So um, throughout this presentation, I'm going to discuss some information about the eels, including their life cycle, which is very diverse and interesting. Uh, and then I'm going to get into some of the science about the eels throughout the Hudson River um, and what we do at the DEC to study the eels. So when I mention the American eel, I'm talking about Anguilla rostrata, which is the freshwater eel known throughout the east coast of both Americas. It's not restricted to just the Hudson River at all. And this is a catadromous species. Catadromous refers to the fact that these eels are being born out in the ocean. Uh, these eels are out um, spawning in the Atlantic Ocean, and then they're migrating to freshwater areas where they live their lives, um, very long, extensive life for some, and then they return to the ocean at the end of their lives to reproduce and then carry on their legacy. Uh, and this is opposite of many migratory fish that we think of. Um, often we think of herring, striped bass, or salmon when we think of migratory fish, but the eel is very unique because it's um, one of the only catadromous species that we have. Um, most of the other migratory fish are actually anadromous, um, where they're spawning in fresh water and then living their lives in salt water. So that's just one thing that makes the eels super unique. But um, I'm now going to get into their life cycle a bit. So I mentioned that they are born out in the ocean, um, but for thousands of years people were studying eels. Um, all the way back to Aristotle and beyond, uh, people were hypothesizing about eels where they come from, why we have these glass eels appearing in estuaries all along the East Coast, um, and no one had actually seen them reproducing. And so in the early 1900s, a scientist named Johannes Schmidt uh, set out on an expedition to find some of these larval eels. Uh, and what he did was go around the Atlantic Ocean looking for these larvae, um, and in sort of concentric circles, going down into a 
one small space in the Atlantic Ocean, he figured out that it's most likely that the American eel is reproducing in the Sargasso Sea. Now, to this day, no one has actually seen the eels reproducing in the wild, so it's still a hypothesis, but it's pretty well grounded in the fact that these are where the smallest larval eels are found, and then they get bigger and bigger as they extend beyond the Sargasso Sea. Uh, and these are known as leptocephali. Now, this is a Latin name, um, and compared to all of the other names of the uh, life cycle, which are in English, the leptocephali has retained this Latin name because for thousands of years, it was believed that leptocephali were a completely other species. They didn't know that this was the larval stage of the American eel. So it's retained the Latin name, which just means narrow head, because they have the tiny little head compared to the weird fanned out body. So most likely born in the Sargasso Sea, though still completely unknown, um, these little eels start out in the Sargasso Sea, and then they ride the Gulf Stream up to estuaries along the East Coast. Now for the eels that we get in the Hudson River, these baby eels are traveling across the Gulf Stream, but um, depending on where these eels end up across uh, the East Coast of North and South America, that stream within the ocean will change. But the important fact is that these leptocephali are passively being transported throughout the ocean. At this stage in their life, they're not really swimming all that much. They're reserving their energy and really relying on the streams throughout the ocean to transport them. So these eels are, they start off as these tiny weird little olive leaf shaped things, um, starting off with this little A figure. And then as they ride the Gulf Stream or other streams throughout the Americas, they start to metamorphose and transition into sort of a classic young eel that we see arriving here. But um, it's really important that they start to metamorphose and transition to elongate and kind of widen into an olive leaf shape because that's really enhancing their ability to ride the Gulf Stream and passively be transported throughout the ocean. So they're catching with that massive surface area of their body, they're catching lots of water um, and energy that's able to push them around in the ocean. But um, towards the end of this journey uh, for the Hudson River along the Gulf Stream, uh, the eels eventually turn into glass eels. Now this takes about a year from the time they're supposedly born in the Sargasso Sea. Um, it takes a year for them to be transported all the way up into the Hudson River um, to eventually transition into glass eels. Now I put this figure in here just to show you um, some of the diversity within the currents and the streams that they're taking throughout the ocean. Um, and this is limited to just Canada, um, the US and Mexico, but these eels do extend all the way down throughout South America as well on the East Coast. However, the American eels down in South America are far less studied so there are not much information about population numbers and migratory patterns for the eels down in South America. So um, I mentioned that they eventually get to the um, mouth of the Hudson River about a year after their birth. And by the time that they're about one year old, they transition into glass eels. Glass eels are kind of more the, the shape of an eel that you would think of. They're elongated, they're skinny and tubular and they're completely transparent still at this stage in their life. They lack pigment altogether because traveling out in the ocean, it's a big expanse of water. There are predators all around them. And so being clear like this really helps them blend in with their environment and evade predators. So as they arrive in the ocean, they're really important ecologically. They're arriving at the beginning of the year in early spring when everything in the Hudson River and other estuaries um, along the East Coast are kind of waking up from their winter sleep, not actually sleeping, but kind of chilling down in the river, not eating a whole lot. But then um, with the glass eels, there comes this in huge influx of marine derived energy, which is in the form of glass eels. Everything in these estuaries want to eat a glass eel. They're, they're kind of like the potato chip of the, of the Hudson. They're salty and they're crunchy and everything waking up from their winter sleep is gonna wanna eat these eels. So these eels are born in massive abundances because, um, or which helps them because uh, so many things are gonna start eating them at the beginning of the year. So they're a really important food source really far down in the food chain at this point in their life. And as they arrive in the Hudson River and other estuaries, they start to develop pigment. They've now entered a new environment where being clear is no longer as advantageous to them because they're going to start reflecting light and be seen by predators that where um, so many predators want to eat them. So they start to develop pigment. They start to get browner, a bit yellower, 
um, which in the Hudson River is really advantageous for them because we know the Hudson River is kind of murky and dark. It's very turbid. So being a dark eel is gonna be super helpful for them to blend in and adapt to their new environment. So at this life stage, they're referred to as elvers. Elvers are um, in the chunk of three to six inches long. Um, and that can be anywhere from like two to five to six years old, um, really depending on what the eels are eating and where they are in their environment. So for example, eels that are in colder environments actually grow slower than eels that are in warmer environments like in the tropics. So um, depending on where they are, these eels will grow not known exactly how long it takes them to get to the next life stage, but um, the next life stage past that six inch mark is known as the yellow eel. Now these eels are still residents of their estuaries and rivers. They do not exit the um, estuaries to go back out to the ocean to reproduce at this point. They're really staying put. They don't wanna move around a whole lot. They like to migrate to find an environment that they find suitable and then they'll stick put and really just eat a lot sleep a lot and grow and build up as much energy as they can in their body, which I'll get into. So these eels are kind of like the teenager eels. They're awkward and quirky, but um, they're greater than six inches. Um, and that can be anywhere from five years old to 25 years old, depending on the gender, of course. Um, but towards the end of the eel's life um, cycle, if it's a male, that could be anywhere from like 10 to 12 years old. Uh, for a female, it can be 15 all the way to 30 years old, it's been reported, um, before these eels are actually ready to reproduce, to go back out to the ocean. So this entire time, it's really important to note that these eels have not reproduced. They're putting a lot of stock in the fact that they're actually going to be able to make it out to the ocean again and reproduce. Um, but in late summer and early fall, these eels start silvering, also called bronzing. Um, and these eels are undergoing massive uh, changes on the outside of their body and also on the inside. So um, I really like this picture because these two eels are about the same size, but they have really important differences on the outside of their body that really um, note where one is silver and one is just a, a common yellow eel. Um, and this, this top eel is the yellow eel. You can see it is murky and dark on the top and then it eventually transitions to a, a whitey, whiter belly. But this bottom eel has started bronzing where this coloration has become really silvery and sharp and bright. Um, and another important fact is that the eel's eye um, grows and it, it um, takes up a massive chunk of its head space. Um, and the last thing that happens on the outside of the eel's body during the silvering process is that the pectoral fin gets larger. The pectoral fin is the little fin on the side. It's sort of like their little arms <clears throat> that they really rely on to swim. Um, so these eels are changing color. They're um, growing larger eyes and they're growing larger fins. And this is really gonna help them on their journey back out to the ocean because as they travel out to the ocean, they're no longer passively um, just kind of traveling through the water. They're not relying on Gulf streams or any other currents throughout the ocean. It's an active process. So they are really needing those big fins and those big eyes to make it safely to the ocean, um, to their reproducing spots. Uh, and the silvering coloration really helps them um, in, the, in the ocean because they're really bright um, and sparkly on top with the light coming down through the ocean, if a predator is on top looking down at the eel, it really just looks like another part of the ocean, like the sun is just shining through the water. Um, and the bright belly with predators looking up, it kind of just looks like sun. So these eels are really um, incredibly adapted to their environment at each environment that they're living in and each life cycle. Now, um, I mentioned no one's actually seen these eels reproducing in the Sargasso before. So it's still kind of assumed that that's where they're heading. But there have been a couple of studies of tracking these eels back to their breeding grounds. So one really important one for the American eel was um, this 2015 study based out of Canada. Now these eels were captured in Quebec. These were silvering females um, and the females are much larger. So they were able to kind of handle these big tags because the tags were about the size of a water bottle. So they were pretty hefty. So they had to be really big eels, which the females are because they live so much longer. Uh, so these eels were captured and then they were released off of the coast of Nova Scotia. And the scientists decided to release them off of Nova Scotia 
because they they gave it a, a few test runs, um, releasing the eels right where they captured them. Um, and it was too far of a journey and most of the eels that they tagged had been eaten or died. So they decided to release the eels off of Nova Scotia. And this was about 40 eels that they had captured and tagged. Um, and surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to some of you, only one eel actually managed to make it back to the Sargasso or close by, you'll see, um, at day 45. Only one actually made it almost there. The rest of them, the, the tags either popped off early, the eel was eaten by a predator. Um, so very impressively, this eel managed to make it back to the ocean and was big news for the eel world. Um, which is the reason for that is because the, the trajectory of this eel's travel was kind of bizarre. People didn't really understand why at first this eel traveled along the continental shelf for a while up to the um, southern areas of Newfoundland. And then all of a sudden this eel decided to turn 90 degrees and then shoot straight south. People wondered why she didn't just travel directly to the Sargasso, why this path was decided, why she wanted to hug the continental shelf like that. But people then realized that maybe it was due to some sort of magnetic response to the, the Earth's magnetic field. And so scientists started studying the eel's brains and they realized that these eels actually have magnetite in their brains. Um, so very similar to birds, these eels are relying on the magnetic fields of the Earth to actually figure out where they are and where they need to go to reproduce. So um, I know we're talking about the American eel, but very recently, just a few weeks ago, there was another study um, tracking European eels back to the Sargasso Sea. And I didn't mention, but European eels are also born in the Sargasso Sea. They just have to take a longer journey on the Gulf Stream to get all the way around to Europe. And these eels were trapped in Azores, which is um, a small island nation uh, off the coast of Southern Europe and Northern Africa. Um, and what we're looking at for these eels are these little yellow dots. These other colors with the arrows are past studies, past attempts at this tracking. But this new study was groundbreaking because these eels were actually able to be tracked back to the Sargasso. So this was the first successful attempt of actually tracking these eels and seeing them in the Sargasso Sea. Ben? So, yeah, of course. You, you mentioned, we have a question. You mentioned that the tags are this large. They're the size of water bottles. Why do they have to be that big? That seems like kind of a burden for the eel. It, it's very much a burden. Um, it's kind of like us wearing like a cooler size tracker on us. Um, but these trackers have to be so large because they're programmed to take in environmental data. So the, the trackers are taking in the depth of the water that the eels are in, the temperature, the time. And then these eels have to ping that data off to satellites after they're released. So that's a lot of um, capacity within this tracker to be able to manage with um, a tiny tracker. Um, and the eels also, or the trackers also have to be able to float. So there's like a small floating device in them as well. So it's it's a lot to put into a tiny tracker. Um, so that's kind of where technology just is at this point. Thank you. So um, this was very groundbreaking for eel world, um, or is, it was just weeks ago that these eels were actually seen in the Sargasso Sea. Um, and so while this is the European eel, um, the, the locations are probably fairly, fairly similar to the American eel because it's still hypothesized that they're reproducing in the same space. But I've talked so much about eels. Why do we actually care about eels? What is their purpose? Why do we have so many people, as you'll see throughout the Hudson River, studying these eels? Um, and we care about eels because fairly recently in um, maybe not to us, but um, in the eels world, fairly recently, the populations crashed. Um, and it wasn't just for the American eel, it was also for the European eel, which is Anguilla Anguilla, and also the Japanese eel, uh, Anguilla Japonica. Um, and this happened in about the mid 1980s for the Europe, for the American eel. Um, you can see a steady increase, but then um, quite drastically, this population crashed. Um, and where we are right now, is at a slight increase in this population, but it is still very minute compared to the historical levels of these American eels. And this is due to many different reasons. 
um, these eels are kind of facing a lot uh, against them from human impacts to climate to natural impacts as well. Now I have a very extensive list here that um, I don't need to labor over, but there are many different impacts that these eels are facing such as habitat loss with urbanization um, and damming. Um, there's also in, uh, extreme water pollution, as we know, in the Hudson River um, has a legacy of pollution throughout here, though the river is much cleaner than it um, was uh, just a few decades ago. Um, the eels also have faced extreme overfishing, and that is largely due to the fact that no one has been able to get these eels to reproduce <clears throat> in captivity. Um, if you've ever eaten nagi before, that is eel. And a lot of the time, the eel that you're eating, um, whether that's cooked or uncooked, um, that eel is the American eel. And that eel is captured as a baby, as the glass eels. Um, it's still legal in Maine and I believe South Carolina to capture the baby eels. And then those eels are shipped across the world to be raised and farmed to grow up <laughs> to the very large eel, almost at the silver eel stage. And then they're killed for food. So the eels are really intensely fished. Um, and they're so intensely fished because you can't get them to reproduce in captivity. And there are also other major impacts like climate change, whether that's ocean acidification um, as a result or changing um, ocean streams such as the Gulf Stream that these eels really rely on heavily to transport them to their habitats um, and also different food web changes. So when we have in influxes of invasive species or other non-native species that may impact the eels or steal their place in the trophic web, these eels are impacted. Ben? Yes. Question about their decline. Has there been any, have there been any studies that show that they're declining more in some areas and less in other areas? That is a good question. Um, and I don't have a, super specific response to that, but I will say that the populations have seen um, massive declines in areas that are dammed, <clears throat> especially at areas that are dammed right at the front of the estuary along the coast. Um, the damming is the major, is one of the major issues because these eels are migratory and they want to keep swimming upstream as far as possible and hitting a dam like that um, just kind of screws them up. They have to turn around, try to find something new. Um, and so damming is really where or dammed areas is, are really where people see the lowest eel populations and the um, the major crashes. Thank you. And just time check, we're at 25. Okay. So um, I mentioned we have lots of people throughout the Hudson River that are uh, assisting us within these eel studies because these eels are facing a lot of pressures, whether that's anthropogenic or natural. And so uh, with the DEC, eels are used as an outreach tool. So we have lots of schools, um, clubs, and community members that engage in eel research, both to assist in building a robust data set of eel populations, um, as well as improving environmental literacy and awareness within these students as well, just to help them help connect them to their environment. Um, so now I'm going to kind of go back through the life stage and talk about the research that the DEC engages in at most life stages within this, um, the American eel. So glass eels, um, they're coming in to the estuaries uh, in the early spring after they're born, um, a year before, um, and the DEC engages in the Hudson River Eel Project. <laughs> this is um, a community science project that relies mostly on volunteers to go out and collect population data of the glass eels. So each spring, fike nets are placed in the mouths of streams um, in tributaries of the Hudson River, uh, like the Post and Kill, for example. Uh, and fike nets are pretty much big funnels. They have a wide mouth, the eels kind of hit the net and they sw swim inward, and then they hit a couple of meshes um, and smaller funnels that eventually trap them in the net. And then every day, these eels are taken out of the net. They're counted to assess populations within each tributary. They're weighed to look at growth throughout the spring, and then they're released. And most of these releases occur above barriers that would hinder their migration. Um, so for example, at, um, sorry, I'm blinking on the name of it, at the Sawkill, 
the eels are trapped in Tivoli Bays, which is at the mouth of the Sauk Hill. And then those eels are released above two dams that would, uh, or sometimes one dam, depending on the person, um, that would otherwise hinder their migration. So we can really help spread out this population and recolonize areas that historically had massive eel numbers. Um, and this occurs all the way from uh, Staten Island down at Richmond Creek up to the capital region of Hanacroy and Posting Kill. Now, not every project site runs every year. It depends on community engagement and community partners um, and kind of the feasibility of their ability to engage in this project. But throughout the 15 years that this project has, running, has been running, this is every site that has been sampled and engaged community members to assess eel populations within the estuary. And it's really amazing that we have such a robust data set of glass eels um, throughout the Hudson River estuary. And we are only able to actually study this many sites and study this many glass eels because community members engage in this research. Every state along the East Coast of America is required to put out at least one bike net every spring to trap glass eels and assess the populations. So the one required site um, in New York is along Long Island, um, but we're the only state that's actually has a far more robust data set because community members engage in this work and um, help look at populations. Um, and over all of this time that people have been studying glass eels in the Hudson River, there have been over 1.5 million glass eels caught and released above barriers. Um, and you can see starting in 2008, that we see a, a steady increase in these eel population numbers. Now the total glass eels caught is a bit misleading um, because the site number and the effort changes every year. So we do this average, the average eels caught per day, often termed as catch per unit effort. So the eels caught per day, which is effort. And this average line does follow that same trajectory where we're seeing a steady increase in these eel population numbers. Ben, we had a good question come in about releasing the glass eels above a dam. How do they make their way back to the ocean? Yes, so um, as the eels are traveling back out to the ocean, they're much larger um, and they have a lot more resilience when it comes to barriers like dams. So falling off a, a 10 or 20 foot dam isn't really gonna impact the eel all, all that much. They're incredib incredibly resilient. Um, and another way that they can kind of get around a dam where other than just kind of flopping off of it down into the stream is actually going out on land and kind of um, scooting around it <clears throat> because the eels are um, very closely related to amphibians. They're one of the first fish that actually evolved um, in the fish line. So they have traits um, that they've reserved from the amphibian lineage, such as absorbing oxygen through their skin. So they're covered in a very thick mucus coating that assists them in uptaking oxygen um, and preventing them from getting pathogens and bacteria from the air. So if the eel feels the need to, if it doesn't feel safe going down the stream, it can crawl out and work its way around. It's amazing. And uh, Jeff Briggs, who uh, is one of our board members, just commented that eels are found in the upper post and kill. So they are able to move past several significant waterfalls. So if anybody knows Barberville Falls, when I caught eels down in post and kill, I asked that question and was told that, yeah, they can make it up Barberville Falls. Yeah, they're, they're quite incredible. So other than crawling out on land and getting around dams, the eels can climb dams as well in waterfalls um, because their neck, or what we would think of as a neck, eels don't have necks, um, kind of their, the bottom of their body where the gills are, um, it's sort of like a suction cup. It's very wrinkly, but the eels can inflate it and deflate it to actually climb waterfalls and dams. As long as they're moist, they can suction to the sides of walls and rocks and work their way up. So that's just another strategy. Amazing. Um, so I mentioned over 1.5 million eels. These are, this is 1.5 million eels that we've managed to release above barriers and assist in the recolonization of their populations. And along with these <clears throat> many eels that have been caught every year, there are hundreds of volunteers. This year, there were nearly a thousand students and adults 
who engaged in this project and actually got to go out in the stream in waders and touch these beautiful creatures. So that's glass eels. This is how we study glass eels. But moving on to elvers, um, one major impact for the elvers are barriers. So at this life stage for the elvers, they're still working their way up streams. They're still wanting to migrate. But when we have massive barriers, we um, need to know how these are impacting the eel numbers. So one thing that we do is electrofishing. Electrofishing is a technique that uses um, an anode and a cathode connected to, in this case, a big backpack, sort of like a leaf blower, and it sends an electric current through the water, and it um, it doesn't harm the eel. Instead, it kind of irritates them, and they come out of hiding, um, and then they get quickly scooped up by the um, netters, um, and then these eels are, um, their populations are assessed, um, in this case, above and below barriers. So in 2018, um, a group went out to Furnace Brook where there's a major dam that um, people have been looking at to remove the dam to kind of, um, uh, I'm blinking on the word, to help the, the flow of the water and to kind of open it back up to the natural way it was. So this group looked at these eels above and below this major dam on the Furnace Brook. And they then compared this to the lengths of the eels to really look at um, kind of where they were and also the counts. So these eels, um, as you can see, they're bent into lengths, length groupings, um, and then also colored by above and below dam. And the major um, thing that I want to point out is that um, one, there are far less eels above dams, which you can kind of guess um, just because it's a major barrier. But second, is that the eels that are above dams tend to be much larger because it takes so much energy um, and so much intelligence for the eel to actually be able to get above the barrier that it takes them further um, or longer in their lives to actually grow to that size and intelligence ability to get above the dam. So we see larger eels above dams and far lower populations. Another thing that we do to um, mitigate the impact that barriers have on these tributaries is employ eel ladders. Eel ladders are, um, just as they seem, they're, they're the ladder for the eel. They're, in this case, it's a giant PVC pipe that has netting in it. And then there's water flowing through this. And the eels are very olfactory driven. They're smelling their surrounding. They're smelling for that fresh water signal um, to tell them where they should migrate. So we have fresh water from above the dam that flows down into the ladder. These eels pick up that scent of the fresh water and they crawl up the ladder and then they plop into the bucket. And then a few times a week, volunteers go out to count the eels in the bucket and to measure them. And then these eels are then released above um, as many barriers as there are present in that given stream. Um, and interestingly, though it makes sense depending on um, or given their migration patterns, the most eels that these ladders catch are within that three to six chunk. So they are mostly elbers. And this shows us that elvers are the most migratory and most capable of migratory migration um, within their life cycle. So this blue line here in this graph is that three to six inch range. And then it's also grouped into smaller th than three inches, which are mostly the young of year, those glass eels, and then larger within the yellow eel stage. And um, at Crumb Elbow Creek specifically, there are lots of eels that get into these ladders and most of them are the elvers. So this is when they're most active. Ben, do you know why the post and kill is the most northern point on the Hudson River for collection? Is there, is there a real reason for that other than like practicality? Yeah, a lot of it comes down to practicality. Not all streams are um, feasible for this kind of study. They're either too deep too rapid, um, just don't have good access points. But the Post and Kill is very far up the Hudson and pretty close to the Federal Dam, which is where the estuary ends. And the, we're studying these eels within the estuary because that's where we have the most connection to the ocean. And these eels are coming from the ocean. So we wanna be able to see these eels within the actual estuary part of the river. Thank you. Now, um, that's kind of the elver life cycle um, and what we do with elvers. Um, but we also look at the older eels as well. Now, this figure calls them adults, but I will point out that the eels aren't technically adults until they're silvering 
and they're heading back out to the ocean. So um, kind of ignore that adult part. But we study um, yellow eels and adult eels within the Enderkill, which is uh, a tributary of the Hudson and the Margaret Norrie State Park down in Statsburg. And three, three times um, throughout the year, once in July, August, and November, these, um, there are four sites along the Enderkill that are commonly studied. Uh, and we use the same technique as shown before, the electrofishing. These eels are fished and then they're tagged so that we have identifications within the eels. And then uh, every time that eel is caught, the, the length is measured, the weight, the eye diameter is measured, and the pectoral fin length is measured. Um, and I have this in here because it, it's really interesting that this eel um, he was caught at site B, actually she, she's quite large, um, at site B, which is a, a random point in the Enderkill, but this eel was caught six times in the same spot within the Enderkill across over three years, which really shows that this eel got to this habitat and she decided that she was happy there and she was going to stay there for years until she was ready to reproduce. So um, we say that eels are stationary, they like to get to their migratory or the place after their migration, and then they, they stop moving and they like to just chill out and hang there for the rest of their lives, which is really shown in this data. Um, another thing we do in the Enderkill is also fike netting. So similar to the glass eel fike net, we put out just a larger one to capture the silver eels on their way back out to the ocean. So we put this net out um, in the fall, only at times when it's going to rain during the night because eels, want to migrate when it's raining and when it's dark because the rain really helps push the push the creek more than if it were dry it helps get it moving faster and the eels want to reserve as much energy as possible so we fike net and then we again measure the eels their length their weight their eye diameter and their pectoral fin and something that um, has been seen using this data and the the past study data um, is an actual migration of a silver eel within the enderkill so this eel, um, random eel, not the same as last time, this eel was caught up pretty far north in the Enderkill in July of 2014. This eel had um, a four by four millimeter eye diameter and a 14 millimeter fin length. Now that was July of 2014. Then in October of 2014, that same eel identified using the pit tags was um, the pretty much the same size, but the major difference was that that eel's eyes had grown two millimeters in diameter, both vertically and horizontally, and that fin length had gained three millimeters of length in just a few months, which is a massive change compared to these eels across the rest of their life cycle. Um, and you can also see that really beautiful silvery bronze color on that eel. Now we assume that that means this eel is heading back out to the Sargasso. He looks ready. He looks looks colorful, he has a massive eye and a massive fin. Um, so we assume he's going back out to the Sargasso, but um, you can never really be sure with the eels. Now I've talked to you for however long about eels, I could go on forever and ever, um, but I really wanna emphasize that these eels are massively important to the ecosystem. At each life stage, they're important, whether that's as a major influx of potato chip energy at the beginning of the year into estuaries or as the apex predator in the stream system um, as a, a massive female eel. These eels are really important and understanding their populations and their migratory patterns really helps us understand how they may be impacted with future, future anthropogenic impacts on the environment. So I really just want to want to tell you that you can help improve our understanding of the eels. Um, and if you are interested in eel research, then please reach out to either me or Sarah Mount, who really heads this eel project research um, based at the DEC. And I'd love to answer any questions you have. Thanks so much, Ben. That was great. Thank you. If you'd like to come off mute to ask your questions, this would be the perfect time to do that. Ben, I was wondering about the name of those nets. Do you know where that comes from by any chance? I do not know. 
just it's an interesting kind of a, a bizarre name, but um, no, I don't. So Ben, we have some questions in the chat. Um, what is their diet? Yeah, I can. What do they feed it. on in fresh water? Do they? I'm sorry. What do they feed on? Water? And what do they feed on in fresh water? Does their diet vary? And just in general, their their yeah. diet. So I'll start off with the leptocephali. Um, as the larval eels and very young approaching the glacial stage, the eels are feeding on marine uh, marine snow, it's called. It's all of like the little bits of phytoplankton, algae, um, and marine debris that's falling through the ocean into the Gulf Stream. And these eels are picking it up and eating it. And as the eels grow, they'll really eat anything organic that will fit in their mouth. So um, the younger eels, they'll eat a lot of algae um, and a lot of organic bits of detritus. And then as they grow, they'll eat small fish, they'll eat crayfish, which they especially love, um, and they'll eat each other as well. So they are cannibals. Um, and then as they get to um, a really large stage, they'll, they'll just eat anything that fits in their mouth, especially the females, which get significantly larger. As the apex predator, they'll eat anything um, and everything in the stream. Um, the smaller ones also love macroinvertebrates, which are the insect larvae within the stream. Um, which is a really important food source for smaller ones. Thanks. And we know your research is focused here locally, but do are you able to say anything about Pacific eel populations? Um, I don't know a whole lot about the Pacific eels. Um, I I think it would be an assumption if I was going to talk on that. So I will I will not. That's fine. <laughs> um. I was just going to suggest, I recently read a book about eels, but it was about, it took place in Europe, and it, I don't know if it was Ireland. I was just wondering if you, I think it might have been the story of the eel. I can't remember the title, but if you knew it, other people might be interested in reading it. It was, it was really quite good. I have heard of that book. It is, it is good. Thank you. Is that, is that the right title? I can't remember the story of the eel. Um, I believe so, yeah. Anyway, I enjoyed it. Somebody else might too. Is it like fairly unknown that the eel that you would eat, for example, when you go and eat sushi is sort of that this has been the destiny of that eel? Because I didn't know that. I love sushi and I won't eat eel anymore now that I know that they were probably captured and and you know, raised in captivity and then killed for sushi. I feel like there should be um, a movement to of awareness around that. I know. Um, I, I agree with you, but at the same time, these eels um, are really economically important for a lot of areas, like Maine. Um, the glass eels just a few years ago were going for upwards of two thousand dollars a pound. Um, so in a lot of places, people really rely on this for their own well-being. Sure. Someone asked about the Delaware River and Pennsylvania and whether you happen to know if there's a similar program um, focused on the eels there. Um, not that I know of. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but I don't believe there is one as extensive as the Hudson River project. Hi, so you mentioned that the eels were, um, you know, would, would eat each other. So I'm assuming then that they're probably fairly territorial. How much space do they need in a stream? And, you know, do they tend to be, um, you know, uh, in, in pools or open water? Or are, they, are they more shy and, and hidden? Um, yeah, so people think of the eels as pretty solitary. Um, they prefer rocky habitat that they can really bury themselves under the rocks and um, hide. No one really knows exactly how much space they need to take up. Um, but recently we were out at Black Creek, which is in a sopus, um, and we caught hundreds of eels within a, a small stretch of stream. Um, and we did the math and it, it seemed like these eels were every couple of cubic meters, um, which that it was a, a very high density stream for eels. Um, but they they do they are um, people do 
call them pretty solitary. Now we keep eels at Nori Point um, as educational uh, tools. We have them in some tanks there. Um, and I've noticed that these eels don't really mind each other at all. They, they actually like to cuddle with each other under the rocks. Now that may just be due to the fact that they're stuck together and, and forced to love each other, but um, they, they cuddle. Um, uh, and they're all pretty comparable sizes, so they know that they can't really eat each other. Now, if you put a glass eel in with the older eels, they will definitely eat it. So I think that they're pretty, um, pretty okay with each other as long as they're uh, pretty similar sizes, though the instant uh, a larger eel or a smaller eel comes along, they're, they're either out of there or they're going to eat it. Not often you hear the, this, a sentence with the word eel and cuddle in the same yeah. way. <laughs> I know. It's weird, but they, they really do like to hang out with each other. Ben, someone asked another question about the tag. How yeah. is that tag attached to the eel? Um, so I mentioned two tags. The tags that we use at the Enderkill to identify the eel. Um, now that tag is super small because it's only an identification tag. So that tag is about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and Sarah Mount, who is a, um, the, the big head of this project, she, um, she's she been doing this for years. And so she handles that tagging where she'll put a tiny little slice in the eel's stomach cavity. Um, and put that tag in and the eel heals pretty quickly. Um, but the, the larger tags that they use to track the eels through the ocean, they're kind of like strapped around the eel's body, sort of like a zip tie type thing. Um, and it's kind of hanging on top of the eel. Thanks. Someone commented that in the Delaware, there may potentially still be eel fishing that is like an in like a commercial eel fishing. Do you know about that? Um, I don't know about that. I just know of the two legal states where it, you can trap the baby eels. Um, I don't know of any um, fishing for the adults. And that was Maine and where else? Maine and one of the Carolinas, I believe South Carolina. Got it. What water depth do the eels uh, travel at when they are migrating across the ocean? Good question. I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to mention, but um, in the 2015 study of the American eels, um, the scientists actually found that these eels travel vertically as well throughout the day. So they're kind of like going, they're going up to the surface of the water towards the nighttime, and then they're going all the way very deep in the water during the daytime um, to escape the sunlight. So they're not really at a, a steady depth throughout their entire migration. They're kind of tripling their journey by going up and down throughout the day. This is a story about the Delaware. I think that there's a, it's fairly famous. There's a guy that owns a piece of the river that has, a, um, you know, a native people's old eel weir made out of stones and he maintains it and he captures the eels and he, he, he smokes them and sells them. He's got a pretty good business going. And I, I think a lot of people reference geographically, you know, somewhere near the eel weir, you, you go upstream or downstream from the eel weir. So it's pretty, uh, you know, historic thing on the Delaware. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. At Marmoreville Falls at the base, uh, I was talking to a fellow who caught an eel there about four feet long. Uh, he wasn't interested in it, so he let it go, but that's a pretty big eel. Yeah, that sounds do like they a... Get, do they get bigger? Um, I don't know, that's pretty big. I know the, the biggest eel that has been caught in the known to have been caught in the Hudson River was about five feet long, I think. Um, and she was caught in the Sock Hill by Bob Schmidt. Um, but the females usually average, um, I'd say around three feet in this area. Um, the males are significantly smaller. The males are usually at about one foot. But the, the females do get very massive. Um, because they, on their way back out to the ocean, they have to be able to grow all of their eggs. Um, so they're growing six to eight million eggs. And so that's a lot that they have to, a lot of space they have to have and a lot of energy that they have to build up. Thanks. Ben, I was wondering, since you mentioned it's only legal to fish for them in a couple of states, is there, like, uh, I don't know what to call it, other than eel poaching that happens in other places, for lack of a better term, like 
you know, for selling them since they're so valuable? Um, that is a good question. And I, I haven't really heard a whole lot of eel poaching, um, especially in this area. I know it's definitely a concern within this project that people will kind of learn where the glass eel nets are and then go out and poach them. Um, but there haven't been any issues with that across the 15 years. Um, I think people in this area especially have been pretty respectful of the fact that they're very protected um, and in need of our conservation. Any other questions for Ben? Oh, here's a someone comments. I saw an eel caught on a minnow in the Delaware Canal when I was a kid, and it was five feet long. Wow. Uh, I hope that eel got released safely. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time, um, people who fish kind of think of the eels as a nuisance because the eel tends to swallow the hook and then it's kind of impossible to get it down out of its stomach. Um, so you usually just kind of have to chop the line and hope that the eel makes it. Any other eel experiences or stories or questions? Well, thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Very interesting questions. Thank you, RPA community. And uh, we hope to see you again next month. Enjoy your evening.